Uh, it seems that as soon as man created fire, they also had to figure out a way to put out that fire. Now, as early as 400 BC, there are records of ox stomachs being used to transport water to put out fires. They would fill the big uh, bag-like organ with water and then carry it to where the fire was, put it on the ground, and stomp on it to spray the water at the fire. And you can imagine that these enormous water balloons didn't have that many reuses before they were torn or couldn't, they begin to leak and they couldn't be used again. So people had to find a different solution and the bucket was born. I mean, it could be any kind of bucket-like thing. It could be a woven basket lined with pitch or it could be a wooden uh, pail lined with leather or maybe it's made out of clay or the old favorite, the tin pail. And you could use buckets for all sorts of things. You could use a small bucket, like a glass or a mug. You could use big ones to be a cistern, or maybe a grain silo, or a water tower in the middle of the village. Because buckets are great. Honestly, I love buckets. And my only worry with my bucket is, you know, if it's going to develop a leak. Maybe it'll rust out. Because I wanted to keep my stuff safe. And so I got one with the lid, you know, because you can put the lid on top, keep out the outside elements, keep out the critters. If I really wanted to keep safe, I'd MacGyver a way to get like a padlock on here. You know, it would make it harder to get into my stuff, I'm sure, if I wanted to share it with someone, but it would keep it safe. And then I wouldn't have to worry about it getting lost or stolen. I wouldn't have to worry about thieves. Have you ever worried about thieves? Have you ever worried when you were walking into a store, or maybe into your home, and you went, did I lock my car? Have you ever worried about a different type of thief, the thief called chores that steals all your extra time away on a day off? Have you ever worried about perhaps a different type of thief during the holiday seasons you're not sure you have enough money left to buy all those gifts you want because of that pesky thief called the car payment that keeps stealing all your extra cash. See, this season of thanks and giving that we find ourselves in is commonly plagued with extra stress and worry as well, which is like a thief that can steal our joy. And in today's Jesus story, our Lord is going to show us how to move from worry to trust, how to trust God to provide for our needs, and how to trust that God is a loving Father. And so I'm going to ask for my first slide to be put up that gives us the page number for our scripture. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12. We read it already, but I invite you to open up your Bibles again. We're going to dig through it together. If you brought your own paper Bible, open it up. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 57 of the New Testament. And we're in a, a section, the section that we're going to be spending the most of our time in uh, starts at verse 22. But verse 22 has a very important word. Jesus says the word, therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore, that means that you have to go backwards to find out what came before it so that you know what the therefore is there for. Huh? Do I need to say the joke again? Okay, that's all right. Let's find out what the therefore is there for by starting up at verse 13. Jesus is teaching a crowd and he's instructing his disciples. And then someone calls out from the crowd and says, uh, Master, uh, why? I, I need your help. I need you to um, convince my brother to share the inheritance with me. It's a dispute over stuff. It's a dispute over money. And uh, Jesus decides not to get involved with the family matter at all. Instead, he turns it into a teaching moment, and he says, be on your guard against greed. This is in verse uh, 15, if you're following along with me. Be on your guard against greed, for your life doesn't consist of the abundance of possessions. 
Jesus hears this dispute over money, this dispute over stuff, and he connects it to greed because he knows that disputes over stuff reveal that there's greed in our hearts. And Jesus wants his followers to guard against greed, not because, you know, greed is a bad thing that good people don't do, but because he knows that greed is just the result of our hearts believing a lie. It's when our hearts believe the lie that more stuff will satisfy our needs. Isn't that what greed is? It's a lie. And we've bought it. Because we've got needs, we've got wants, we've got desires. And we've bought the lie that more stuff will fix that. More stuff will satisfy us. More money will get us the life that we want. So we start pining after stuff. We start holding our stuff more tightly so we don't lose it. We start putting padlocks on our buckets. And then Jesus tells a parable about a rich man who had an abundant crop. It's a good harvest. It was a great year. He feels great. And he's got a problem. His problem is he's run out of storage. So he's got to get more storage. Isn't that incredible? That's a good thing. Oh, you need more storage. He's feeling so blessed. He posted on Instagram that he was hashtag blessed. So he decides to tear down his barns and build bigger ones so that he can store his abundant crop. And then he sits back and he says to himself, you've got a lot. You've got more than enough. So just relax, feel happy now that you've got more stuff. But God responds to the man. This is in verse uh, 17. No, sorry. This is in verse 20. God says to him, you fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? Because when you die, all the stuff that you've stored up, all the stuff that you've kept for your stuff, for yourself isn't for you anymore. It's given away. It's fought over by your heirs. And so Jesus has just pointed out that the pursuit of stuff, the greed that results because of it, the worry and stress that come with it, they're all ridiculous Because our pursuit and enjoyment of stuff ends with death. And then Jesus comes to the passage that we're digging into, starting in verse 22. There's our word, therefore. So because of all that that he's just said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Don't worry. Not even about food or clothing I mean, maybe you're rich, and so you're not worried about simple things like food and clothing. Jesus says, don't worry about your riches. Or are you poor? Don't worry about finding money or winning the lottery or when is my inheritance coming? If you're hungry, don't worry about where your next meal is coming from. If your clothes are ragged and worn out, don't worry about needing a new wardrobe. Why? Well, look at the birds. They don't farm. They don't get storage like the man in the parable. God provides for them. And you know what? You are way more valuable than the birds. You're God's beloved. You're his kids. Besides, this is verse 25, worrying doesn't add anything positive to your life. You can't even add time to your day to accomplish the things you're stressed about. In fact, worrying takes up time. Now you've got less time to do the things you're worried about. So, don't worry about anything else either. And then he continues, I mean, come on, just look at the flowers, right? You seen like a freshly opened flower? I mean, Jesus must have been walking along as he's teaching his disciples and those listening, and he's pointing out normal everyday things and weaving it into his teaching so that when the people who are listening are walking through their everyday life later on, maybe a couple weeks later, and they see these everyday things, they get reminded again of God's providence. And so Jesus says, look at the flowers. They don't fashion clothes for themselves. They don't sew They're not on looms making out cool scarves and jackets for themselves, but they're so beautiful. 
There's nothing more beautiful than a freshly opened flower. And do you know what? Like, the grass gets clothed with flowers. You know, grass, the thing that gets mowed, the thing that we bale up and use for something else, the thing that is here today, gone tomorrow. God clothes the grass with flowers. And you are way more important to him than grass. So don't you think that he will clothe you as well? He'll protect you as well. So do not worry. See, all the, all the powerful nations of the world spend their time worrying and striving for these basic necessities. Because apparently power and influence doesn't make you immune from worry. But do you know what does help you worry less? Knowing that you have a loving father that knows exactly what you need. So don't strive after all these other things that so many people worry about. No, instead, strive after the kingdom of God. So he says, spend serious effort towards obtaining the type of life that shows that God is in control and that we trust him. Because here's the good news. God is able to provide for all of your needs. God is able to provide for all of your needs. Do you know that? Like, like truly know that. I mean, you, you might somewhat agree with the statement. Yeah, I know. God is able to provide for my needs. But too many of us live as if we don't truly believe it. Too many of us, myself included, we put our trust in stuff, right? See, when we put our trust in stuff, we worry. We worry about how to get the stuff that we're putting our trust in. And maybe, maybe for you, you put your trust in the money that's in your account. Tell me if this uh, rings a bell, if you want to know if this is you or not. Maybe you spend time worrying about how to get more money. Or maybe you spend time worrying about the economy right now. Maybe you're checking your bank account often or your retirement accounts to see, how's the economy affecting this thing I have? Or maybe you're in a place where first thing in the morning when you know your paycheck's about to hit, you wake up and you check the banking app. Is it there yet? Or maybe you check to see if your social security check is there yet. Is it there yet? Maybe money isn't the thing that you put your trust in, but maybe you find yourself putting your trust in the stockpile that you have in your basement. Does our church have any preppers? Yeah? You know who you are, right? Okay? When you go to the store and you just buy a little bit extra, you know, just, just to have extra. You pick up some extra toilet paper because we wouldn't want to have that crisis again like we did a few years ago, right? So let's just get some extra toilet paper while we're at the store. Let's just get it, you know, or some extra canned goods or some extra cleaning supplies because I think the Meyer spray is running low. And so you think, yeah, I'll put it with my stuff. I'll keep it there. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel more secure that we have it. You know, I'm just going to get a backup to the backup, you know, just in case we need it. Because there might be another issue with the pandemic. We don't know. Like, the government might shut things down on us again. Maybe there's going to be supply chain issues. There's always supply chain issues. So let's just get a little extra. I, maybe an ice storm is going to hit. We might not be able to go out to the store. We can't trust the food and the supplies to always be there. So let's just make sure to get some extra now while we can. Because it's going to make me feel better, more safe to have it in the house. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should all just expect Amazon to have everything we need at all times. I'm just saying that when we put our trust in stuff, then we spend time worrying about how to get that stuff. We focus on what we can get. We focus on what others have. We focus on what we want that we think will satisfy us or make us feel safe. But Jesus knows that worry is a thief. 
And God is more than able to provide for our needs. That's why he says it in verse 30. God can provide for your needs. And, and we might need to reassess what are our wants and what are our needs. But God, our Father, knows what we need. So don't strive after these things that so many people worry about. No, instead, strive after the kingdom of God. Spend serious effort towards obtaining the type of life that shows that God is in control and that you trust him. So he says, devote your life, not just devoting your life to possessing more stuff, as if that's the thing that you can trust to provide for you, but devote your life to possessing more trust that God is a loving father who's able to provide for you. That's striving for the kingdom. That's learning how to trust God. Because when you put your trust in God, you're going to learn just how good of a loving provider he is. So then he continues in verse 32. He says, in fact, you don't even need to strive that hard for the kingdom because it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, did you see that? Did, did we hear that? You have a father that knows what you need and who is able to provide for your needs. And so he encourages us not to strive towards stuff to provide for us, but to put our efforts into learning how to trust him by living a life that demonstrates that he is king. He encourages us to strive for the kingdom of God type of life because here's the good news. God loves you more than you can fathom. We know this because Jesus has been using a term, a term of endearment. He says, oh, you of little faith. And then here he says, oh, little flock. A term of endearment. He's speaking as a father to show us what the heart of the father is like, that he loves us more than we know. You know, he's speaking like I do when I call my daughter baby girl. Right? I'll be like, hey, baby girl, come on over here. How you doing? And, you know, my daughter's four years old, going on 14. And so she says, I'm not a baby. And I'll look at her and I'll smile and I'll say, I know, but you're my baby girl. And she'll smile and she'll trot off. See, Jesus is speaking the same way to show us how God the Father sees us. Oh, little one, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you what you need. Maybe this is hard for you to accept and fully integrate into who you are, that maybe it's hard to hear that you have a heavenly father who loves you more than you can fathom. See, too many people think that God is loving, yes, but we also think that he's mostly a judge who is concerned with watching what we do to decide if we're living right or wrong, right? We think that maybe he's just watching us, waiting for us to make a move so he can decide whether or not to punish us or reward us, depending on how we're living. God loves me. Uh, refers to me with terms of endearment. I mean, that might feel foreign to some of us, but it's true. God is actually a father who loves his kids and loves to provide for his kids. See, God loves you more than you can fathom, and he's able to provide for all of your needs. And when we trust that, when we move from worry to trust in the fact that God loves us and can provide for us, then it enables us to live the kingdom of God type of life that Jesus is describing, and this is how he describes it. He says, sell your possessions and give alms. See, once we move from worry to trust in the fact that God loves us and can provide for us, then the next natural step is to minimize the stuff that we surround ourselves with. Because that is, if it's near us, it's so easy to slip back into thinking that that can provide for us. So um, maybe to give an example of this, I heard a story of a, a life group in Seattle that did this, oh, radical thing. 
They were contemplating this idea that God is a provider that has given them everything they need and is able to provide for all their needs. And they got together and they were wrestling with this and they, they wondered if, if God had maybe given them some of their stuff to actually provide for the needs of others. So they did this radical thing that honestly, I'm not sure if I could do. They got these big post-it notes that you can pull off and stick to the wall. Maybe you've seen some before. And, and they started writing down everything they owned. Like seriously, each member of the life group wrote down everything they owned. We're talking cars, tools, gadgets, their homes, toys, everything, clothing. They wrote it all down on these big post-it notes. And then they stuck those post-it notes all the way around the living room where they were meeting, the, the host family that they were meeting at their house, and they stuck them all around the walls. And then they realized that God had given them so much abundance. And they asked maybe if God had a purpose for that stuff beyond just their own family. Because God had provided more than any of them actually needed. And so they decided to do something radical. They decided to sell half of their belongings. Now, each family got to decide which things were included and which things weren't, but then they proceeded to sell half of their, committed to it. We're gonna sell half of our stuff and each person did it in garage sales or Facebook marketplace and stuff. And then they pooled the money together afterwards and then asked God, what are we supposed to do with this money? See where God led them. And ultimately the timing was perfect for their group because they knew of a single mom. And right at the time that they did this, that single mom that they knew in their community had lost her job. And they knew immediately that God had provided this pool of cash to be able to help support that mom while she was looking for another job. And so they were able to do that just like that. And then the rest of the money they used, it went to a nonprofit in their area that was working with school-aged kids. And there's more to that story that I'm sure I'll try to tell you at some point. But I want us to just hear that part of the story and, and wonder how it might increase our imagination to see how God is is able to work in us, but also through us. See, God is such a good father that he's able to provide for all of our needs, and he's even able to provide for the needs of others through us. But it's a lot harder to enter into that type of lifestyle when we keep all of our stuff in a bucket. Right, because a bucket is great at holding stuff. It's not that great at spreading stuff. You remember that image I asked you to think of at the beginning with the townspeople passing the buckets one to another to put out the fire, the bucket brigade. Well, let's just say that lots of houses burned down because the buckets weren't that good at keeping up with the fire. And so that's why in 1673, a gentleman by the name of Jan van der Heiden and his son Niklas invented the first fire hose by sewing together 50 feet of leather tubes. And on the end, they had a gooseneck nozzle. And all of a sudden, people were able to get the water closer to the fire without they themselves having to stand too close. And they could pump even more water more quickly than the buckets could bring. See, the buckets are great at storing water. They're great at carrying water, but they're not so great at spreading water. Maybe that's why it's so hard for us to be generous with our stuff that God gives us. Maybe it's because we're viewing our life like a bucket. It's great at carrying stuff. It's great at storing stuff. And so we've been able to collect some water, some of our stuff. We've been able to, you know, conserve the stuff when we need to. And we can even share the stuff when we're able to. But what if we change our mentality of our life like a bucket for carrying stuff? And what if instead we change our thoughts to be about life like carrying a hose? See, a hose is no good for collecting water. 
It's no good for storing water either because it's awkward to carry around a hose. There's no handle. There's no lid. I don't know where you'd put a padlock on a hose. No, the natural response when you're holding a hose isn't to use it to store anything. The natural response is to look for a water source so that you can use your hose to connect it to the water source and then send the water to where it needs to go. So are we treating our lives like a bucket meant to just hold and collect what we have, even if we're grateful to God for giving us what we have, and that is good, but are we collecting and holding it? Or are we treating our lives like a hose, like a conduit, whose whole purpose is to receive what we're given and then send it to where it's needed most? Do we want to be collectors or do we want to be conveyors? See, Jesus has laid out the path for for this type of life. First, we need to know that God is able to provide for all of our needs. And second, we need to believe that God is a good father who loves us more than we can imagine. And that's when we're able to move from worry to trust. That's when we're able to stop trying to hold so tightly to the things we have because we know that they're all a gift from God and there's more where that came from. That's when we're able to store up heavenly treasure by using what we've been given for the purposes that God gave it to us for. And so that's how when Jesus ends our passage in verse 34, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling us that our treasure dictates our heart. So if you want to move your heart to be more aligned with what God feels, then Jesus is saying, well, then move your treasure. You want to start trusting God as a more loving father, more loving provider? Well, move some of the things that you treasure to where God wants to use them, and we'll see that our heart follows that. And this can be a slow experiment. We're not saying to just change everything you've done with your life or your resources. This is best to be done like that life group in Seattle with prayer and in the community. Because sometimes we're blind to the things that we treasure too tightly and hold too tightly. And so I want to invite you, maybe just have this conversation with your life group. And if you don't have a life group, I want you to join one or at least find someone trusted that you can have this conversation with. Pray together that that God will give you some ideas of how to move some of what we treasure to be used by God rather than just stored up for ourselves. And this includes treasuring what we do with our time and our talents, in in addition to just the resources we have, right? Because maybe God wants to redirect some of your time. Maybe God wants to convey some of your time to serve someone else, to align your heart with his love and compassion for those who are needy. I mean, maybe that looks like allocating some time to serve or spending time learning more about a cause in your area. One thing that comes to mind is one of our members here, Don Steint, who spends time every single week in the cancer ward at the hospital, just spending time with the patients, being present to them, building relationships, building trust, getting them water, helping them get the attention of the nurse, just being generous with his time. How might God be inviting you to redirect some of your time to serve others? Maybe God wants to redirect some of your talents to be used for the benefit of someone else. I mean, this could look like donating your skills to help out in some way. I mean, honestly, if you know anything about the history of this church, part of the story is a group of men and women that donated their skills for a whole year to build this campus that we spend each Sunday in enjoying. Maybe God is inviting you to do something like that, but maybe it's even something smaller, something like donating the skills of the, the people who are part of our sewing group and our knitting group that donate their skills every week to provide quilts and blankets for babies and those in the hospital. What skills has God provided you with that he's asking you to use for his mission? And maybe God is inviting you to redirect some of your money towards the church or towards some other kingdom initiative because he wants to grow your heart towards those things as well, maybe. Now, hear me. 
I'm not saying for you to give more money to the church or more money to a kingdom initiative that's gonna then put your family at risk or put yourself at risk. I'm not saying to only donate your skills. That's what makes a Christian. See, one of the ways that God provides for our needs is through the skills we have so that we can get paid. Like you're allowed to be a Christian and charge for your services. I'm not saying that you need to burn yourself out or neglect your family because you're giving so much time to something. God is able to provide for all your needs, even without your help. But because he's a loving father who loves you more than you can imagine, he likes to involve us in his work so that we can grow and mature. So we get to learn how to move from worry to trust by asking God where he wants to redirect some of what we treasure in order to transform our hearts to match his heart a bit better. We get to see all the small ways that God already has provided for us. And we get to use some of what he's provided to take care of ourselves. And we get to use some of what he's provided to take care of our families. And we get to use some of what he's provided to plan for our future and, and put money into our grandkids' college account. And we get to use some of what he's provided to join him on mission every day and provide for the needs of others that he's directing us towards. Because he's able to provide for all of our needs. Because he's a good father who loves you more than you can imagine. And he will never completely forsake you. And so that's what allows us to learn how to worry less and how to trust him more and more each and every day. And isn't that good news?